We read from the Word of God a portion of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. In the last part of chapter 1 and all of 2, and then in the first part of 3, the Apostle has been looking at the corruption and sin of Gentiles, non-Jews, and then to that of the Jews. And he's compared the two, or looking at both of them as those as that they have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So he starts in verse 9 of chapter 3. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. And then there's no better way to do that than with Scripture. And so that's what he does over and over. As it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that search, seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Most of those passages were from the Psalms, and from Isaiah. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. May God bless our reading of his word. It all is summarized in that statement that there is none that doeth good, there is none righteous, no, not one, in verse 10, and then the summary of it in verse 20, by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, 
And then 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're going to look at many other passages of Scripture to substantiate this, especially in the last part of the, of the uh, first point. But what we want to consider is that eighth question and answer. And here the question forms more of the teaching than the answer. Are we then so corrupt that we are wholly incapable of doing any good and inclined to all wickedness? Indeed we are. Except we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. Answer 5 brought us to this point. That's where we got started. Can we keep the law of God perfectly? In no wise. We're prone, prone. It is our nature to lean toward hating God and our neighbor. Did this hatred come because of the way God created us? No, he created us good and after his own image. Well, question seven, whence then proceeds this depravity? The answer is from the fall of our first father, Adam, as our father and our representative head. How far did he fall? That's the question that we want to answer this morning. How far did he fall? Now the answer is going to, can be given in two words. Familiar words, the first of the five points of Calvinism, total depravity, total depravity. That's what we want to consider, but we want to just note this first before we dive into it, that when we're talking about total depravity, we're going to talk about the nature of of every human, man and woman, Jew and Gentile, old and young, as they come into this world, by nature. This is our condition, totally depraved. Now, secondly, that's also the only accurate description of the old man Every elect has. So we may be elect, and we may have regeneration already taken place within us. But every other part of us, apart from the heart, the heart's regenerated. But apart from that heart, my mind, my will, my emotions, my conscience, is accurately described with the words, totally depraved. What do we mean by that? It's a wickedness and a corruption from within. Defilement comes from outside. Depravity is a corruption that comes from inside. This is not what men may judge, but this description of depravity, this corruption from within, is according to the verdict of God. So we're not going to let ourselves be the judge. We're not going to listen to what others may say, but we're going to listen to what God says. God is the one who gives this verdict and this description of our nature. Second, God's not only the one who makes the judgment, do we, but he is also the one who sets the standard. And the standard is his own great glory, God's perfect holiness. And so God is going to 
make the judgment. Do, do you match up with what I am? Not how do you match up with others, but do you match up with me? And in answer to that, God always answers, according to the scriptures, that we come short of the glory of God, that we are, to use the words of the question, wholly incapable, completely incapable of doing any good, and we are inclined to all evil, to all wickedness. Any time that we don't hit that standard, we violated it. And that's a good word. We violate. Not just a standard, but because the standard is God, we violate God. Think of the worst, gross, most gross thing you could do to another human. That's what every sin begins to look like against such holiness. That's what depravity is. The nature of that, the extent of that depravity is described for us in Ephesians chapter 2 this way. Very familiar words. And you hath he quickened, here it goes, who were sick in trespasses and sins. No, not sick. Dead. Not a little sick, not seriously sick. Dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. Physically alive, but spiritually dead. So that spiritually we're like that corpse that you see in a coffin. You can talk to it, never going to answer. You can give it a command, never can obey, completely incapable of doing any good, as far from doing good as a dead man is capable of breathing and living. When you want to check if somebody's alive, you look for their pulse. And when there's no pulse and no heartbeat, then, then you stop. We, we might want to try to the paddles, but when that fails, then, then we stop because we say there's no hope anymore. They're dead. You, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. The Westminster Catechism says that we are indisposed, disabled, made opposite to all good, wholly inclined to all evil, and from whence proceeds all actual transgressions. Listen to, listen to the Belgic Confession, Article 14. Willingly, willfully subjected himself to sin and consequently to death and the curse, giving ear to the words of the devil, which he, and for the commandment of life which he had received, he transgressed. By sin he separated himself from God who is true life, having corrupted his whole nature, whereby he is made liable to corporal and spiritual death. Being thus, he became wicked, perverse, corrupt in 
all his ways. He hath lost all his excellent gifts which he had received from God, retained only a few remains thereof which, however, are sufficient to leave him without excuse. For all the light that is in him is changed into darkness. As the scriptures teach us, the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not where St. John calls men darkness. The canons, fifth head, describe man's depravity this way. By reason of these remains of indwelling sin and temptations of sin and of the world, those who are converted cannot persevere, could not persevere in the state of grace left to their own strength. Spots adhere to the best works of the saints. There's no hope. Now, if this is an accurate description, the canons and the confessions and the catechism get us started in that. But now let's look at Scripture. God said to Adam in Genesis 2, verse 17, The day that you eat thereof, you shall surely become sick. No, in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. You don't have to but turn a page or two to get to that most accurate description of man as God saw man at the time of the flood. And he said this in Genesis 6, verse 5. God saw the wickedness of man was great, that every, not most, not a few, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, now listen to these two words, was only evil continually. Only evil continually. This came to man because of our fall into sin with Adam. Romans 5.12 By one man sin entered into the world. And what came with it? Death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. All men are spiritually blind and deaf to spiritual truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're not only foolishness unto him, but he neither can he know them. He cannot even know them. He's incapable of knowing them, for they are spiritually discerned. Romans 8 Verses 7 and 8. To be carnally minded is death, because the carnal mind is enmity, hatred against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. David said, that this was his condition from conception. I was shapen in iniquity, in, in sin, into the sphere of sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 58, verse 3. No, not 3, just 6. They prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst thereof. They are fallen themselves. God looks at us and he passes this kind of judgment. There's more. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. 
Who can know it? Mark 7. Jesus says, It's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but that which cometh out that defileth him. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And we could quote many other passages of Scripture. Depravity is an accurate judgment of God about man's spiritual condition. And this reign of sin is universal. It covers everyone. And, and the worst part of it is that we take that knowledge and man holds that knowledge down in unrighteousness and it is his nature and character to deny it. He cannot see not only God, but he cannot see the reality of himself. At no time does an elect child of God look more like the world when we say, I didn't sin. When we seek to justify, shift the blame, excuse, minimize what we do and what we are. No more clearly do we look like the ungodly than we make when we make excuses. In that condition, we are unable to repent. Unable to be sorry to God. Unable to want to do good. For God's sake. What's the explanation for this? You've heard of Pelagius. He lived at the time of Augustine, a monk out of, Rome, out of England. And he had writings that Augustine answered. Pelagius held that every human is born clean spiritually clean, and that he is able, he learns sin. He learns it. He learns it from his experience of observing others. The Pelagian theology is the basis for modern day answers to problems in society. They're poor. If you give them money, if they're not poor, then they won't steal and sin. You've got to educate them because it's their lack of education which is the reason for their sin. That all has Pelagian theology at the basis of it. Man's born okay, but he learns sin from outside by watching others. Take him out of his environment, put him in a different environment, and he'll be good. After Pelagius, there were the semi-Pelagians. They said that man was born not clean, but a little gray. Sick. Not dead. The Arminians, answered by the Synod of Dort, made a statement about depravity that if you would read it, you would say, pretty good. 
In one of the first classes that I had in the Protestant Reform Seminary, the professor set before us the statement of the Arminians about depravity and said, what do you guys think about it? He did it on a test. All of us said, sounds good. And he said, oh, that's what the Arminian said. Because you didn't understand what they meant, except you saw what they said about grace. And that's why the canons take the third and fourth heads of doctrine and put them together. The first head of doctrine doesn't follow the T-U-L-I-P, the TULIP acronym, but goes with unconditional election, limited atonement, and then total depravity and irresistible grace are put together, three and four, and then the perseverance of the saints, the fifth one. Because the Arminians held to this position, man is totally black. If, if you could say the, the Pelagian position is a chalkboard, that, not a chalkboard, a whiteboard, it's totally white. And then the semi-Pelagians, you just made it, you, you put a haze over it so that it was gray. Then the Arminians would say, you make the whole thing black, except for a little corner. And that's man's will. And you can shade that in because it's kind of sick. But it's possible, through the call of the gospel to persuade that will of a depraved sinner to believe. He's not completely because there's that little corner that's just sick. But through the power of persuasion, you can make him say, I accept the offer of Jesus Christ. The, Armeni the, the Calvinists answered by saying, no, there's no little corner that's less than. The whole thing is black. Man is born dead in trespasses and sins. There's no hope. And that's what the word total, the adjective total, is applied to. Now, in the last 50-some years, there have been those who have been talking about absolute depravity. And now they make a distinction between total depravity and absolute depravity. And you've got to be careful because it's a relatively 50 years old, kind of a new thought. But by doing that, making that addition of absolute, they want to say, a different, they put a different interpretation to the word total. And then they'll say this. Total means every part of man is corrupt. And then they come up with this wording. But not as sinful as he could be. But there's not any part that's not corrupt. Now, absolute depravity, they say, is every part is completely black. He's not as sinful as he could be. Absolute, he's as sinful as he could be. The Father's didn't address that wording specifically, but they did address that thought. And our fathers would have said, is man as sinful as he could be, is asking the wrong question. And every time you ask the wrong question, you're going to come up with the wrong answer. The language of our confessions is perfectly clear. That question Question 8 says it. That's all that we have to know. Not is man as sinful as he could be. But what is total depravity? It is this. He is so corrupt within that he is wholly incapable of doing any good. Wholly. 
completely incapable of doing any good. And he is inclined to all wickedness. There's not an evil or a wickedness out there that man is not leaning towards. And one, when one matures in the faith and he gets better and better pictures of the holiness of God, the more ready he, sa- he is to say, yep, there is not a single sin out there, no matter how gross it is, that I am not inclined to do, given the right circumstances, I would do it. To say, is man as wicked as he could be, is to ask the wrong question, because anything that doesn't come up to the standard of God's holiness in God's judgment is sin. And the question is, does man always sin? And here we're really helped by remembering the three parts of the description of good work. What makes something good? Well, one, it has to proceed out of a true faith. Romans 14.23 Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Anything that we do that's not out of faith Do it because faith, we're connected to Jesus and we believe that He is God's Son and we don't do it out of that awareness. Anytime we don't do anything out of faith, the description of Scripture is, it's sin. It's sin. At any and every moment, every human sins. So again, It's not a question of whether our sin is worse than another sin, but is God's glory being given to Him? Is praise being given to Him? Am I thanking and honoring Him? Am I doing it out of faith? Then it's sin. Depravity, our depravity. My depravity. Completely corrupt. Except there be regeneration. Now before we talk about that regeneration, let's look at what's the significance of the truth and confessing the truth of total depravity. First, Only if we have an accurate description of depravity are we going to truly be able to understand correctly the doctrine of election, the doctrine of the atonement and salvation, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Only when we correctly understand depravity will we get all those others correct. And basically it's as simple as this. Man's total inability to do good. Man's complete ability always to sin. Makes it absolutely necessary that salvation is a work of God. And a work of God's grace. then that God would choose some of those that are fallen in Adam, to use the words, the language of the canons, that God would choose any is a wonder of grace. Because remember, remember how the canons begin that treatment of election. The very first article again, All men have sinned in Adam, lie under the curse, deserve eternal death, 
God would do no injustice to leave them all to perish and to deliver them to condemnation on account of their sin. Then the second article, the love of God is manifested in that he sent his only begotten son into the world that men may be brought to believe God mercifully sends messengers of this great message about the gift of his son and that the wrath of God abides on those who don't believe this gospel, but such as receive and embrace Jesus by a true and living faith are by him delivered from the wrath. The cause and the guilt of that unbelief as well as of all sins is found in man himself. But faith, the ability to believe in Jesus Christ and have salvation through him is a free gift that some receive the gift of faith from God and others do not, proceeds from the eternal decree of election. You correctly understand depravity. Then election is unconditional, gracious, Ephesians chapter 1 says that so well. According as he hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace to the praise of the glory of His grace. Romans chapter 3 taught us how the truth of under salvation is truly understood. Only if you say, there is none that doeth good, none righteous, no, not one, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then you can say, verse 24 of Romans 3, justified freely by His grace freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. Where is boasting? It's excluded. There can't be any boasting. Not by the law of faith, because faith and grace go together. Verse 16 of chapter 4. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace over against deeds, works of the law. There's none that can do good works enough to be saved. Second, significance. The scriptures make it clear that God has to powerfully do this good work of regeneration. So dramatic is this work of regeneration that when Jesus was describing it to Nicodemus, he equated it to being born again. And by that kind of a description, and then Jesus added by the Spirit, which is like the wind that blows where it listeth. When God says the only possibility of being saved is not by virtue of first birth, but by virtue of second birth, being born again. Because it's only when we're born again, he says that one can see God, can see the kingdom. But let's apply that further. It's only by the fruit of regeneration that we can see ourselves accurately. If I am not born again, I am going to continually deny and excuse my sin. I'm only going to be comparing myself to others and I'll find some that I'm better than. Or I'll despair because I'm worse than. But when I look up, Regeneration enables me to see him in his holiness. And all that that does is it turns on the light of God's holiness with such brilliance 
that, fi- that, that then I begin to see what I'm really like. That's why sorrow for sin against God, godly sorrow, is not only an infallible fruit of election, but it's an evidence of regeneration. I am born again because now I see myself for what I'm really like. Then with Paul, he came to save sinners, and I'm chief. Then one's eyes are open, and that's when one flies for refuge to Christ crucified. So the first significance of a correct understanding of our depravity is that helps us understand all the other doctrines of grace. The second significance is then we see the absolute necessity and importance of regeneration. Third, we are very good at understanding doctrine and getting it straight intellectually. But you can have your doctrine straight and go to hell. The devil has it straight. Genuine understanding of total depravity, totally incapable of doing any good and inclined to all evil, leads correctly To walking humbly. The canons. This is a constant matter for humility before God. And just as love of God is going to be shown in love of neighbor... So humility before God is going to be shown in humility before our neighbors. Meekness is going to be evidenced in that understanding of depravity. And Eric, anytime we're arrogant, anytime we're proud, we are not truly living our faith in total depravity, and in the necessity of Jesus Christ. Anytime one is not consciously flying for refuge to Christ crucified, driven by the knowledge of his sin, he does not really get total depravity. Anytime I excuse, anytime I say everybody else is doing it, anytime I say, well, so-and-so is a whole lot worse, Anytime I make all those justifications, I am not a believer in total depravity. I can get it here, and I'll go to hell if it's all only there. This is where it has to be. Fourth. Remember that the Lord of glory came from heaven to save, not little sinners, but the chief of sinners, lost sinners, helpless sinners, the vilest sinners. That's the gospel. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He came to cleanse, not 
from moderate guilt. But those who knew their sins to be as red as scarlet and as crimson. Now be careful. Let us not dishonor the cross by thinking that I'm such a sinner, I couldn't be saved. Don't dishonor the cross. He came to save the vilest, the chief. His blood, the blood of the Son of God. Do you believe that Jesus is God's Son? Is omnipotent to save. And then we have to say with Mary and Elizabeth, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Can my sin not be overcome by the blood? Do you know what honor he's going to have in glory when we hear that he has forgiven us? Not of 100 pence but of 10,000 talents times 10,000? That's the honor and the praise. That's what he took from us upon himself. And he gave us his robes. That's why we glory in the cross. That's what it means to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why we praise Him now and forever. Amen. Humbled and broken. We despise ourselves for our natures, corrupt. But that thou dost give us the ability to see it, to see them as they are. And even now we admit our eyes are just beginning to see them. In the judgment day we'll really clearly see how vile and despicable we are. But that's when thou wilt show us how precious, how honorable, how absolutely valuable is the blood of thy Son, who not only just covered the crimson and the scarlet, but dost make us to be as white as snow. Thanks, Father. Amen.